All right, this is chapter 11 in Fool's Crow. Um, you're taking a quiz on this on Tuesday the 6th. So um, you all have a copy of the book. I would suggest that you follow along. Um, otherwise, if you're more of an auditory person, you can just sit and listen. Um, and there's that. So um, this chapter has a lot to do with gender rules. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in here, and I'll probably stop to um, explain some stuff, but we do need to really hustle through the back half of this book, so let's go. Early in the moon of the burnt grass, not long after the sun dance, Red Paint sat outside her lodge resting her back. She had just fleshed a green blackhorn hide, and now it lay stretched to dry in the sun. She looked at the glistening white skin, and it reminded her of the puffballs that grew in the valleys of the backbone. She wished she was there now. The rivers were clearer and colder, the smell of pine was always sharp in the air, and the choke cherries would be ripening. Only last summer she had been a girl and had accompanied her mother and some other women up to Two Medicine River to pick the tangy, tangy cherries. It was there that she had seen the round mushrooms and had picked one the size of her fist and held it against her cheek. It gave off a dry musky odor and its skin was as smooth and hard as her own thigh. Except for the short, dark whiskers on the bottom, it was as nearly the perfect thing as she had ever seen. She had taken it home to her father's lodge, but soon it became leathery and collapsed it upon itself. One day she squeezed it, and it split, sending out a puff of green smoke. In six days, White Man's dog would ride with the war party against the crows. As she rubbed her neck and looked off to the sweet grass hills, she felt again the dread that came whenever she allowed herself to think. She had tried to stay busy, but even a momentary lapse in concentration allowed that dreaded thought to steal through her whole body. She knew that war parties were part of a man's life, and she knew that she should be proud that White Man's Dog had been selected to count coup on behalf of her father, Yellow Kidney. But it was because of Yellow Kidney that she felt so fearful. In her mind, the crows had grown big and fierce. She knew of their cruelty, and she was afraid White Man's Dog would become foolish in his desire to avenge her father. Last night, she had told her Sorry, he had told her he would look for the lodge of that treacherous enemy, Bull Shield, and bring his head back for Yellow Kidney to spit upon. She knew this was the way a man prepared himself for a war party. All the men were talking this way. She had heard her own father tell of cruelties he would inflict upon the enemy, but that was in the past now. She just wanted her husband to be safe. Her husband. Once again, Red Paint marveled that she was married and keeper of her own lodge. Even more, she found it unbelievable that she had come to love White Man's Dog with such heart. Now when he was away hunting, she could hardly wait for his return. And when he did return safely, she offered up silent prayers and cooked such big meals he complained that he was getting fat. Sometimes at night they would sleep away from camp under the stars, naked in their robes. They told ghost stories until both were frightened, then they made love, as though the night were made only for that. Afterward, she would tell more stories that would make him laugh at her wild inventions, but the way he held her when she slept made her a little afraid, for she would never be able to live without him or without his love. Foreshadow. And now he was restless and he would not be at peace until she had counted war honors, sorry, until he had counted war honors against the crows. Last night he had struggled and cried out in his sleep and she knew that he was frightened. Red Paint unrolled another green blackhorn hide and began to stick it down. As she pounded with her stone hammer, she thought again of the choke cherries in the mountains and wished they were there now, just she and White Man's dog, and maybe the little one inside of her. For the first time in four winters, she had missed her time to bleed. It was far too early to tell anything, but in her heart, she was sure she was with child. She looked uh, toward the lodge and saw a butterfly flitting against the stretched cover. It landed on the tied back entrance flap. It was small and white with black tipped wings. Sleep bringer, she whispered to herself. Daughter, why is it your daydream? Sorry, why is it you drape day? Daughter, why is it you daydream when all the other women are dressing black horns? Let me help you. Heavy Shield Woman took the stone hammer from her daughter and quickly staked down the hide. It had been 16 sleeps since she had been the sacred vow woman, and she was recovering her strength. Red Paint looked at her face, and in the bright sunlight, it looked shrunken, the lines around her eyes and mouth deeper, the hollow of her cheeks shadowy. Even her strong brown fingers looked almost bony, but she struck the stakes with great force, driving them easily. You look different to me, mother. Have you not recovered from your fast? Heavy Shield Woman stopped pounding and looked across the skin at her daughter. It's the same as giving birth, she said. One expects a little change. Someday soon I will appear as I was before, but I will always be different in here. She thumped her chest. I want you to be strong and happy. Red paint bent over the skin and began to work her fleshing knife over the surface, scraping away the dark meat. She wondered what the white people would make out of the robe. Once she had asked her father, and he said they made big shirts and leggings of them. 
He said that they dressed like bears in their big towns because their skin wasn't used to the cold. But he often joked with her, so she didn't know if he was telling the truth. Yellow Kidney's lodge had once been filled with laughter. How is my father today? Better. Heavy Shield Woman scraped a long, thin strip of flesh from the hide and tossed it in the trampled grass behind her. A fawn-colored dog darted in, snatched it up, and ran away. Just this morning, he made a harness for his right hand. He tied a short piece of skunk rib to it, and he's going to try to fire a gun with that. He can hold it, all right. He just needs a trigger puller. Red Paint sat back, sat back on her heels. A sudden breeze filled her nose with the scent of dry sage. Is he going to be all right? These changes take time. Already, you see, he is trying to become the hunter he once was. Heavy Shield Woman busied herself with a thick strand of meat. He is a tough man, your father. But I mean inside and in here, his heart. Heavy Shield Woman did not look up. He is not the same man. He no longer laughs. He doesn't play with your brothers or instruct them. She ripped the scrap of meat loose. He did not touch me if he can help it. She felt a stab of guilt, for if she did not mind that part. Since becoming a sacred vow woman, even before that, she had lost a desire to hold a man close. In some ways, he had become a child to her. She looked after him the way she cared for a good young man in one spot. So, uh, red paint, or, sorry, heavy shield woman and, and yellow kidney, their relationship has completely changed since he came back. Um, remember, she was a sacred vow woman. She had this huge responsibility placed on her, and now she feels like a different person, and he's a different person. So, their marriage has changed. What can we do? said Red Paint. Her voice was a wail. My poor mother, we must do something for him. We must restore him. Do not weep, child. I have talked with Makapi. You know his magic. He assured me that he can drive this bad spirit from Yellow Kidney, but he must have your father's cooperation. So far, your father prefers to dwell in his own thoughts, to pity himself as though he were the only one whom misfortune struck. Red Paint almost flinched from her mother's bitter words, but Heavy Shield Woman laughed. At least he has his hair back. I've been rubbing his head with tonic from the sharp vine. Now it's almost as thick as it once was, but he does not eat. I can't force the food down his throat, can I? Red Paint looked off toward the lodge. The butterfly was gone. Soon it would be too hot to work, and she looked forward to going into her lodge alone to lie down and listen to the silence. She was tired and longed for the cool breezes that whispered down the valleys of the backbone. She longed to be there with her husband and to lie in the lodge and listen to the cold water rushing over the stones. I think I'm growing a baby inside me, she said. She meant to add that she felt it only in her heart, but as soon as she said it, she saw the tears in Heavy Shield Woman's eyes. Her mother dropped her scraping knife and scrambled across the skin to kneel before her daughter, hugging her in her thin arms. She hugged Red Paint and wailed to the sky. Red Paint felt the tears on her own cheeks and suddenly felt happier for her mother than for herself. Perhaps a baby would bring them all closer again. Perhaps laughter would ring out again in Yellow Kidney's Lodge. She looked again at the place where the butterfly had landed, if there was a baby that she knew in her heart, and she would tell White Man's Dog when he returned that evening. So think about what um, a baby represents, right? What's the symbolism there? Um, how does she feel about her future? What kind of emotion is she feeling? Um, also, is it significant that the butterfly is also white? I mean, in our last chapter, white didn't really mean good things, but um, it's this white, peaceful butterfly, right? The young warriors of Crowfoot's band galloped their horses through and around the camp. They whooped and shot their guns into the air. The puffs of smoke from the barrels were carried to the north by a strong south wind. Most of them were shirtless and their bodies were painted with war paint. Crowfoot himself wore his flowing war, war bonnet. Yikes. His face was painted red with three black crow tracks on each cheek. He pulled to a halt before the lodge of three bears. Hiya, three bears. Are there any lone eaters brave enough to take on the war road? My young men say yours are puny and would do nothing but slow us down. Three bears stood in his finest regalia. He too wore the flowing headdresses of the parted hairs. His war shirt and leggings were of soft elk skin decorated with quill work and beads. He raised his long pipe. He was excited as his young men. Ah, Crowfoot, your braves are children against mine. I myself, old as I am, stand over your strongest men. If it weren't for the length of the ride, I would accompany you and count coup on those insects myself. Um, so they're boasting here, right? So um, Crowfoot is the leader of another band, and Three Bears is the leader of this band, right? Um, also, the parted hairs are the soup. Crowfoot laughed. Where's my friend Rides at the door? I suppose he is too old, too. Oh, hey, look at that. <laughs> Popular. <laughs> Uh, again, the warriors galloped through camp, shouting insults and making fierce faces. But by then, several of Three Bears' men had started beating on a communal drum with sticks and singing wolf songs. The songs had no words, only the attack cries of the big mouths. 
Some of the lone eaters had spears and shields and fainted at the riders as they galloped by. Rides at the door trotted toward the two men, wiping dust from his eyes. His war paint was simple, a blue streak from his forehead to the tip of his nose, but his black horn headdress made him look big. The curly hair of the top knot had been dyed gray. Welcome, Crowfoot. I see you did not teach your young ones to save their shooters. The two men embraced. It's a good time, said Crowfoot. Tonight we make noise. When the sun rises, we will join the others who assemble at the camp of the small robes. Does your son ride with us? Both of them. Running Fisher hasn't slept for three nights. He lies outside the lodge and watches seven persons take the night journey. As for White Man's dog, he looks forward to many war honors. He is no longer a boy. I saw him dancing from the medicine pool. He acquitted himself well. Crowfoot looked at his friend shrewdly. I hear he is married, too. Yes, sometimes these things happen. <laughs> he is married to Yellow Kidney's daughter, Red Paint. Rides at the door glanced into Crowfoot's face. He hoped his friend wouldn't feel dishonored because White Man's dog had rejected his daughter. Crowfoot watched the mock attacks for a moment, then he laughed. You know that crazy daughter of mine, little bird woman? That nothing girl is gonna marry into the grease melters. Three sons oldest boy. I tried to talk her out of it, but she told me three sons is a great chief. I don't know about her. Um, so if you remember a couple chapters back, there was talk uh, when White Man's dog was visiting all the other bands to tell them about um, coming to the Sundance. Uh, they tried to hook him up with this character named uh, Little Bird Woman, but obviously he only had eyes for red paint and also kind of his stepmom. <laughs> All right, Rides at the Door smiled. He felt relieved for Little Bird Woman was going to marry into a very important family. Three sons was next in line to become head chief of the Pacunis. This talk of women depresses me. My sits beside me woman gives me nothing but trouble these days, said Three Bears. Now, gather up your important men and bring them to my lodge. We will smoke the pipe. I myself do not see anybody out there worth smoking with. I love that line. My sits besides me, my sits beside me woman gives me nothing but trouble these days. So sits beside me woman would be like their most important wife, their oldest wife. And you're like, ah, oh, she's giving me grace. And I was like, ooh, moving her to having three wives. All right. Four more wives, whatever. <laughs> uh, the booming of three different drum groups carried far into the night. Wolf songs, scalp dances, and honoring songs competed with each other. The girls of the Lone Eaters sang celebration songs. Then they sang a love song that broke up into giggles. Inside the Men's Society Lodge, the older warriors feasted and counted war honors. Before the group broke up, Three Bears passed the ceremonial pipe and offered a prayer for the party's safe return. He burned a braid of sweetgrass and fanned the purifying smoke out through the lodge, then declared that the pipe was empty. The men filed out, some to sleep with relatives or friends, others to stretch their soft tanned rolls out under the stars. From one of the lodges came the last sad notes of night song. Then the camp was quiet beneath a yellow half moon. Um, I think that's interesting what the men and the women do when all these um, bands start getting together. The girls are de described as getting together and singing silly songs and the men are, you know, smoking the pipe and being very honorable. Gender roles. Red paint lay beside her husband, her right arm and legs slung over his wide body. Her right arm lay beneath her, sorry, his right arm lay beneath her, his hand stroking the small of her back. Are you happy for us? She murmured against his chest. Yes, very happy. He knows. You've been very quiet these last days. You think of the war trail. War trail. I think of many things, but making war on the crows is uppermost in my mind, he admitted. You will be successful, I think. You are the strongest of the Pacunis. White man's dog slapped her butt and laughed. Yes, but am I stronger than all the crows? You are the strongest man I know, she said, stronger than the Blackhorns, too. You speak with the tongue of crawls along the ground, nothing, woman. Again, teasing, um, but just he's telling her she lies like a snake. So, Red paint smiled in the darkened lodge. From far off, she heard the barking and howling of Kisino. Um, soon he was joined by his brothers, and the night was pierced by their mournful howls. howls. The little wolves cry to us, my husband. Are they afraid? Um, so I'm thinking those are coyotes. Uh, que si no. Oh. They cry to the night red light. She shows half her face and they want to see the rest. They are only happy when she smiles down on them. Remember, night red light is the moon. And you, are you afraid? She felt her husband's hand go rigid against her back. He sighed and said, yes, I am afraid. Of the crows? Yes, no, not of the crows. My medicine is strong. My luck has not been better, but can you fear nothing? There is always a chance that a crow shooter will find me. I do not fear that, for I will die an honorable death. I have spoken with old man, and he will guide me to the sand hills if I am killed. No, I do not fear for myself. Old man knows the way. 
Mm. White man's dog shifted and held his wife in his arms. Red paint smelled the sweet tobacco on his breath and thought they were the closest they'd ever been. She began to tremble. I am afraid for you and for our infant inside of you. I'm not certain. I have never had such responsibility, and it makes me cry to think of you alone. You are a brave and good woman, Red Paint, and you work as hard as a woman twice your size. But without meat and hides, you will suffer, and I must think about your family. Yellow Kidney and your mother and brothers, they too depend on me for their meat. Your brothers are a couple of winters away from hunting for their family. Do not go then. Red Paint raised herself on her elbow. Your father will understand. He is a kind and wise man. Ah, if only it were that easy. White man's dog looked away and studied his pemmican sack hung from a lodge pole. He could barely make out the red and blue designs on it. You see, I have chosen the way of the warrior, and so I must take that trail, wherever it leads. If I were to stay behind, the others would lose respect for me. For an older warrior to say his medicine wasn't good and he must not go, it would be understandable. None would question him, for that is the way. But I am a young man, and my power is good. Red paint rolled away and looked up through the smoke hole. She could see a few stars, but they were indistinct, far away. She knew he would have to go on the war party, but for the past two days since telling him she might be with child, she had held on to the faint hope that this knowledge would make him stay. But no, he would be thought of as a coward, to be shunned by the people he cared for, perhaps even his family. Red paint sighed. I think you want a boy, yes? Yes, he admitted. Would you want a boy named Sleepbringer? Sleepbringer? But why? Because I saw a butterfly at the very time I was thinking of a sun growing inside of me. It was white with black tips on its wings. It sat and watched me and soon I fell asleep and dreamed wonderful dreams of a proud young man who looked like you. Sleepbringer. It is a fine name. We shall have a naming ceremony when he is born. We will ask my father to do us this honor, but just you make sure you whisper Sleepbringer in his ear. Uh, Komiyashi is more like it. I do not know what that means and I tried looking it up and I can't find it anywhere. White man's dog laughed as he patted Red Paint's belly. Soon he will be struggling like a worm. He will want to be born so he can stand on the ground of many gifts and look around. He will be just like you, only shorter. They laughed and hugged and gradually the happiness wore off and they hugged each other tighter and listened to the coyotes sing their songs to bring the moon around. All right, switching gears, same chapter. All the war chiefs were there with the exception of tail feathers coming over the hill. His horse had gotten too close to a black horn bull and the bull butted the animal, causing it to fall on the chief's leg. Someone said the leg had turned around backward and that tail feathers coming over the hill would not walk again. He had sent his only son, Badger, in his place and there was concern for the boy's safety for if he were killed, there would be no one left to carry on the chief's tradition. But the boy insisted and after a brief, brief counsel, Fox Eyes, the head boar chief, called him over. That's an important character to keep note of, uh, Fox Eyes, the head boar chief. We know your father wishes you to accompany us, and so you shall, but you must stick with some of the experienced men and learn all you can from them. You are young and will no doubt attempt something foolish. I will keep my eye on you and the other young ones. The first sign of foolishness, I will turn you around and you will have to explain to your father why. Fox Eyes looked around at the assembled warriors. Some were sitting on their horses, others lounged in small groups. There were over 300 of them. Most were proven fighters. They would have to look out for the young ones. Good luck to you, Badger. If you listen and do as you are told, you will bring honor to your father's lodge. The camp of small robes were where all the band warriors had assembled was on a grassy flat near the point where the Yellow River joined the Big River. Um, it was here that the first big treaty was signed nearly 13 winters ago. That's the treaty we read. That's the Treaty of 1855, the Lame Bull Treaty for the Blackfeet. Um, so it's been 13 years since that treaty was signed. So it's like 18... 78. Uh, Fox Eyes could remember sitting almost on the exact spot where he now stood, listening to the Napaquan chief spell out the conditions of his treaty. One of the conditions was to cease making war on their enemies. But how was that possible when the enemies continued to insult the Pacunis? Were they not justified in earning their enemies' respect once in a while? And two, the Napaquans did not honor the treaty. They spoke high words that day, but they proved to be two-faced. Four wolf scouts sat patiently on the bluffs to the south. Fox Eyes signaled to them and they galloped off. Then he called to his war chiefs and to gather their men. It had been three winters since the last such party. The winter, the entrails people and the crows were made to cry. Um, the entrails people are the Grovant. Fox Eyes had been a war chief then and he had killed White Grass, the famed warrior of the entrails people. He had brought back his enemy's head on a lance and the Pacuni women had kicked it around before roasting it on a fire. Gross. 
From that time, Fox Eyes became known and feared among his people's enemies. Now, as he looked down at the faces, he prayed silently to the above ones to make him wise and correct in his role. He wished to return those husbands, fathers, and sons to their lodges. He needed no war honors and was concerned only with his leadership, for on that would their fortunes depend. He stepped forward. The brass buttons on the tunic he had taken from a slain Caesar chief glistened in the high sun. Hear me, warriors of the Pakuni people. Sun chief smiles down on this spot where the small robes choose to summer and causes all of us joy and excitement. But he also knows that a great wrong has been done to one of his children, and he wishes us to punish those who would laugh at the Pakunis. For this reason, we now take up to the war trail. Our brother, Yellow Kidney of the Lone Eaters, is not among us, for the crows have mutilated him and shamed us all. In his place, White Man's Dog, son of the war chief and leader, rides at the door, will count the first honor against our enemy. It has always been so with our people, and so it shall be. So they had a tradition in the war. So basically, uh, <clears throat> White Man's Dog needs to make the first kill. There are many among us who go to war for the first time. Let them follow the counsel for their chiefs, sorry, of their chiefs, and no harm will come to them. If their hearts are not in this, now is the time to turn back. There is no dishonor in wisdom. For those who would be foolish and seek to gain glory only for themselves, let them also turn back. In that way, there is no profit. The war chief paused and stared up at the groups of young men. His eyes seemed to find each of them and looked directly into their eyes. And he lifted his head. Now I pray to the above ones, to the below ones, and to the four directions to grant us success against the crow dogs and return us safely to our families. The war chief Fox Eyes is heard. The old men, women, and children watched the warriors ride away. Even the dogs did not bark or try to follow. They sat silently in small packs, tongues hanging from the midday heat. Some of the men in the rear sang a riding song as the party climbed the bluffs. The horses were all painted on their shoulders and haunches, around the legs, some in the face. Fox Eyes was the first to reach the plain. He kicked his roan horse into a faster walk, not quite a trot. His feathered shield bounced against his left arm. Made from an old bull's neck skin, it was the same shield with which he had fended off White Grass's arrows. He had hated White Grass then, and it had been this hatred which gave him the strength to kill him. Now he felt a mild regret that his old enemy was no longer around. With his victory, Fox Eyes had lost something, the desire to make his enemies pay dearly, to ride among them with a savage heart. He had lived 43 winters, and he wished to live 43 more in peace. Two of his sons were in the party, and he worried about them. The youngest was only 16. Like the other youths, he would gladly follow the council of war chiefs, but when they closed upon the crows, he would ride blindly among them, seeking to kill them all, to count war honors enough to last a lifetime. This was how the young ones were killed. Fox Eyes looked behind him. All the warriors had made the plain. They were a fearsome group, decked out in their war regalia, their painted bodies, their fastest horses. Some of them carried plumed lances and shields, as in the old days, but most carried guns. To his left, Road rides at the door, and beyond him, Crowfoot, and takes good gun. Crazy dog and lone medicine person, and almost a wolf, were to his right. They were good war chiefs, and would handle their men well. If the Pakunis could take their enemies by surprise, it would go well for them. Perhaps then, Fox Eyes could deliver his men safely home. But if the crows learned of their party and met them at the, with equal force, there would be much grief in the Pukuni lodges. They followed the Yellow River south, keeping to the plain on the east side. Two sleeps away lay the snowy and Little Belt Mountains. To the southeast, a little closer, they could make out the dark forested Yellow Mountains. It would be easy going. Fox Eyes and his chiefs figured they would be in Crow County, sorry, country, in six sleeps. So in six days. Um, I would like you to right now in your book flip to this map in the back. Um, you can see the, um, one of the dotted lines is the war party. Um, it's more of a dash line. So it starts at the treaty site of 1855, um, which is right, I don't know if you can tell, right here, right by the fold. Um, so they go through the Yellow Mountains with the Judith Mountains. So we're talking like over by Judith Gap. So we're kind of like around Lewistown and kind of going through like Judith Gap and the big snowy mountains. Um, so they're kind of cutting right across central Montana to go down to um, Crow Country, which is obviously where the Crow Res is over by Billings. Um, so the Big River is Missouri River. Um, the Elk River is the Yellowstone River. And which one's the Yellow River? That might be just a little smaller one. Anyway, um, so basically they're crossing the central part of the state in six days. Um, the wolves were good, experienced men. Eagle Ribs was among them, but in this open country, they would need luck to remain undiscovered. 
They, were no, they wore no paint, no regalia, so even if the enemy discovered them, they might think the wolves were simply lone hunters. But they would be sweeping the country for distant movements, for recent fires, for black horn guts. They knew the signs of men and how to interpret them. But even now, thought Fox Eyes, a crow party or their allies could be watching us from any of the surrounding buttes. A party of 300 men was hardly invisible. So they have 300 men that are going to go down to the crow land and attack um, the band of Bullshield. Um, and remember our, our friend uh, Eagle Ribs from the other scouting party that they did when they were stealing horses. Um, when they call in the wolves, that just means they're like scouting, right? So they're going to be like a few hours ahead of everyone scouting things out. Fox Eyes called to Lone Medicine Person, who had been most recently in Crow Country. My friend, I hear you have taken crow horses this season of home days. Did you come upon the camp of Bullshield? We passed it by. It is on a small creek between the Bighorn River and the Red Mountains. I had too many youths with me to risk taking their horses. Fox Eyes almost smiled. Lone Medicine Person was a rangy man with a big nose and large hands. He was proud of his horse-taking ability. Were there many? I counted 80 lodges, and there was another camp a short distance away, 38 lodges. Lone Medicine Person spat, and the white hide hunters were with them, seven of the Napaquan lodges. They had many big ears to pull their wagons. We did not wish to get mixed up with them. Their guns are big and sound like thunder. I didn't want any of my youth, youth to piss on themselves. The war chiefs laughed, and then the men behind them laughed. Fox eyes, big roan, put back his ears in disapproval. And you, lone medicine person, were you frightened? You bet I was. Those guns can make a man's guts want to leave his body. When I get old, I want to tell my grandchildren I have seen something. I would like to punish shoots near the water and his people, said Crowfoot. He took some of my best horses last heavy wind moon. He took that big horse with the spotted rump I took from the black paint people on the other side of, black, of backbone. Remember, black paint people are Nespiers. Rides at the door tells me you got that horse from the liars, said Crazy Dog. He said you had to sleep with their ugliest women to get him. The liars are the Cree. Um, so now they're basically trash talking. So they're riding through the plains and they're like, you know, trash talking all the other tribes trying to like hype each other up. Rides at the door tells lies that make the liars look good. Their women are ugly, though, admitted Crowfoot. They make good wives for the Napiquans. I have seen their offspring. They are pink like the entrails of the slippery swimmers. Even their eyes are pink. Fox Eyes listened to this banter with patience. The men were happy to be finally on the move again, or sorry, move against the crows. The tension of waiting for this journey was dispelled, and the men could now joke and laugh. But it would return in a short time as they neared the enemy's camps. Fox Eyes had made up his mind, and he felt a tingle of excitement crawl up his backbone. When the talk died away, he said, I think we will punish Bullshield. He is the strongest of their chiefs, and many will cry for him. He is the head that will be cut off so that our friend Yellow Kidney may sleep well in his lodge. Um, okay, got another. So first part of this chapter was Red Paint Woman being like, I'm pregnant. Second part is the men going out on the war party, and now we're kind of coming to the third chunk. I'm going to pause this real quick so I can make a phone call. <laughs> okay. Just after midday of the fourth sleep, a strange event took place. The party had ridden down to a shallow coulee just north of the Elk River, keeping above a brush line that marked the course of a dry creek. Um, so that's the Elkstrom River. The grass around them had turned golden, and I don't know why I did this, as if, like, this is the state of Montana and this is now also the Elkstrom River. <laughs> <laughs> the grass around them had turned golden in the late summer sun. The yellow wings jumped and buzzed in the air before the horses. Fox Eyes had decided to await the return of the wolves at the mouth of the coulee. Um, yellow wings are most likely grasshoppers, and remember, the wolves are their scouts, not actual wolves. Um, from there, they could see the valley of the Elk River and remain unseen. The scouts would by now, ha by now have located the camp of Bullshield. On their return, a strategy would be determined. White man's dog was worried about his horse. Although he didn't limp, there was something wrong with his gait, as though he were favoring a leg. White man's dog pulled out of the dusty stream of riders and got down. The sun was warm on his back as he felt the horse's legs and bent the fetlocks to look at the hooves. He could find nothing wrong and decided it must have been his nerves. He stretched his back and looked up to the southwest. The day star was a brilliant pin of light in the orange sky. He hadn't noticed how bright it was this day. He adjusted his leggings, which had ridden up his crotch during the ride, as they do, and he did. So, as he did so, he noticed that the sky was turning gray. He shielded his eyes and peeked between his fingers. The sun had ceased to glow, and a chunk of it was missing. He had not seen this happen before. He looked down at the coulee and saw the last of the riders round a bend beneath a sandy bluff. 
He became uneasy and tried to mount his horse, but the animal shield uh, shied away from him. He grabbed the horse by the ear and squeezed tightly. Around him, it had become dusk. The grass, which just moments before had been burnt yellow, now was silver and the edges of the coulee cast shadows. Again, he peered at the sun, and this time he didn't have to shield his eyes. It had become a dark ball with just a rim of glowing gold. His horse had gentled some, and he released the ear and stared at the hole which had replaced the sun chief. Gradually, he became aware that his whole body was trembling. The air was colder, but the trembling came from within. White man's dog was too frightened to pray or even to think. He heard a far-off bark of coyotes in the quiet, in quiet dusk. He looked around him, and the grass was shimmering. A large white stone on the other side of the dry creek was glowing as though lit from within. Then, just as the coyotes began to howl, a silver, a sliver of fire appeared at the side of the dark hole. He looked away from the light, and when he looked back, the sun had begun to grow fire wings. Soon, the sun was whole again, and the air warmed quickly. The coyotes had quit howling, and the gray horse grazed at the golden grass. White man's dog remembered his grandfather telling of a similar event. That time, when the sun hid his face, the people trembled and cried. A few days later, Imanisi, the great head chief of the Siksikas, was thrown from his horse and trampled by the black horns. Now, what just happened? An eclipse! Um, you know, the sun is shielded by the moon, gets dark all of a sudden. Now, let's think back to our early days of high school when we read the Odyssey. Um, there's a really important literary device being used here. Um, when the weather changes, it's usually a type of what? Rhymes with blore blattering. Um, it's foreshadowing. So, I mean, when you think about it, like when the weather changes really quickly or when the sun becomes hidden, um, you know, that, that right there could be a bad omen, right? Um, normally, storytellers and writers have been using um, something like that to, to tell like bad juju is on its way um, for a really long time. So keep that in mind. All right. Um, when he caught up with the party, all had dismounted and were crouched silently in small groups. Only the war chiefs were animated, huddled together, gesturing, their voices rising and falling as each spoke his words. He saw his father's broad back, his war shirt stretched over the powerful shoulders, the gray blackhorn headdress, his war medicine bobbed up and down as he nodded his head. He seemed to be speaking, but he didn't gesture as, the, as did the others. Fox eyes sat passively to one side as though he didn't listen to what the others were saying. It is a sign we cannot ignore, Rides at the door was saying. It is a sign of catastrophe, said Crowfoot. White man's dog had crept close enough to hear their words. He squatted beside Running Fisher, that's his little brother. He wanted to ask what the leaders had said before he arrived, but as he looked at his brother, he saw a look of cold fear. The young man's eyes were staring straight ahead at the backs of the leaders, but he seemed to see nothing. White man's dog touched his shoulder, but Running Fisher didn't seem to notice. It was the first time White man's dog had seen real fear in his brother and he didn't know what to do. We've come this far, we must go on, said Lone Medicine Person. We are Pakunis, said Crazy Dog, we are not afraid. Almost a wolf signed his affirmation, his fist over his heart. What about these young men, said Brides at the door. They are afraid now, they can't be counted on. We will talk to them. Those that want to turn back, we will let them. Did we come here to avenge Yellow Kidney? Are we going to run away like women? White man's dog watched fox eyes rise and walk slowly away from the group. He was halfway to the bend that hid the party from the Elk River Valley when a wolf scout rode into a view. His horse was lathered and winded. He slid down and walked up to fox eyes. It was eagle ribs. White man's dog watched the two men talk. Then he looked at his brother. The fear was still there, but his eyes had come back. Awahe, whispered white man's dog. Take courage, brother. Um, dun, dun, dun! What's gonna happen? Um, okay, that was chapter 11. And you also need to take a quiz on chapter 11. <laughs> Good luck.